Okay, good evening, uh, Arun. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Is this Dr. Arun or Arun? Yes, or yes. Dr. Yes, yes. Yeah. You can tell me a few lines about yourself. Where are you from and what are you currently doing? Yeah, ma'am. I am from uh, Kerala. Uh, I am uh, a neurologist. Oh, very good. Okay. Where? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm working in Kerala only, in Calicut, <clears throat> Mims Hospital, Calicut. Calicut. So I have one of my students, but who's very senior there, Dr. Pradeep. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. He's also yeah. from Ames, no? He's from, uh, he's yeah. from the first few papers in sleep that we published, he, pub he published with me. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So, and where have you done your DM from? Uh, from Srijitra. Srijitra. Oh, okay. Okay, very, very good. So, you. and you are any particular area of interest in neurology or whole of neurology? Yes, ma'am. I'm I'm, I completed my fellowship in stroke and fellowship in intervention also, stroke intervention also. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah, stroke and uh, sleep are now very close, close. related. Close related. We're trying to wake up the neurologist to understand the close relationship. Hopefully, yes, we will achieve something. Uh, and Shilpa? Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Shilpa. Where are you from, Shilpa? And what are you doing? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a psychiatrist uh, based in Hyderabad, ma'am. Okay. And you're practicing or what are you doing? Yes, ma'am. I'm practicing. Okay. A At a private clinic, ma'am. Private clinic. Oh, very good. Um, so we'll wait for a few more people. Uh, so you pe both of you have taken this the basic course, this third batch, is it? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And I have uh, taken an additional module in uh, CBT insomnia by Dr. Ravi Gupta. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I actually, um, Snigda. Yes, ma'am. What you can do is at least from these eight, nine people, you can just send them a message. that. Ma'am, I have done. I have just done it again. Yeah. Otherwise, so then, you know, um, what, I mean, if people are late, I don't know. I'm also yes. I have pressed for time, so we will wait. So if you, both of you have any particular questions, so we can start addressing them. I have some list of questions from everybody. But if any of you have any questions or anything that you need to clarify, then you can ask me and I will try my best to answer. Um, is it okay if I start, ma'am? Yes, Sulpa, sure. Yeah, I, I had sent in the question yesterday. My only two cues were uh, if a patient with uh, insomnia has depression and if a patient has generalized anxiety disorder, like for these two separate conditions, uh, what do you recommend would be the best medications to start them on? Okay. So uh, if you uh, kind of study the recent guidelines, etc. for, sorry, I'm going to keep interrupting a bit the people who are joining. So I'll just let them all join. Give me one okay. minute, huh, Shilpa. I I have a with me. So I think let's wait another two, three minutes, then let people come in. Uh, this is Priyanka. You can turn your videos on. If, if the bandwidth or something gets a problem, then we will ask people. At least it's nice to see somebody. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. So is this Priyanka? If I start the video, actually, I'm losing connection. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. Let me know. Where are you from, Priyanka? And what are you currently doing? Uh, Ma'am, I'm a neurologist. Um, I have a uh, 2017 batch from AIMS study and I'm currently practicing as a consultant at Bhuvneshwar, Kalinga Hospital, Bhuvneshwar. Uh, which hospital is it? Kalinga Hospital, okay. Bhuvneshwar. Oh, very nice. Good. So I think I'm at least some mission is being achieved that neurologists are waking up to sleep. Otherwise, yeah. it's been a fighting battle. Uh, is this Dr. Sunil? Uh, you are on mute actually. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am uh, working in ResMed out there. Okay. And now, kya kar rahe Hello? I think we lost him. Okay. So I think uh, Stigda will start. So I'm going to answer uh, Shilpa's question was for the people who joined now. Best medications to use in insomnia with depression and insomnia with generalized anxiety disorder. So what happens is that, uh, as I was saying, that insomnia and comorbid psychiatric disorders 
have a very strong bi-directional relationship. In fact, uh, when we deal or evaluate a patient with insomnia, we have to ask all questions related to their mood, anxiety, etc. Because what's happening mostly in the practice that we are seeing, sedative hypnotic uh, For the people who are not talking at the moment, can you, can you just keep it on mute? Otherwise, there'll be a lot of disturbance. Um, so that's where we are. So there are the American, if for people who want to know, um, like you have in other fields of medicine, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, frequently has updates and guidelines which are published and which are most all mostly free. The access is all free, I, I'm what I meant to say. So they have strongly recommended that the first line of treatment is CBTI. And again and again, they keep saying that the first line is CBTI. But very often you need two things to go simultaneously. That means a pharmacological therapy and the CBTI. So they both get initiated together. That means the efficacy is much more. And then you may need to withdraw the pharmacological treatment, but CBTI has to be continued. So CBTI we will discuss later. So coming to your question about insomnia with depression. So the medications which are sleep inducing. So, and those would be things like uh, mirtazepam, uh, trazonil, uh, prothiodine. These are the ones which are given at night so that they do both the functions together, that they induce the sleep and they take care of the depression. For things like generalized anxiety disorders, it's again, mostly the benzos, but long acting so that they can cover them adequately. And they do not have these intermittent, short, uh, frequent bursts of anxiety, which are very, very um, unsettling and very uh, disturbing for these patients. I just want to add a word of caution because we do have a lot of neurologists here in any case for sleep. Uh, in other words, a lot of these patients with insomnia, be careful, also have RLS. So they forget, forget to tell you and the doctor, so as we forget to ask. So I think this entity, I was just uh, going over my data from March till now, 150 RLS I have seen. And it is extremely disturbing as to what has been happening to their lives. Uh, they are all grossly mismanaged. In fact, I thought we'll have a separate RLS thing one day. Um, wrong diagnosis, wrong treatments, and they are walking the whole night, rolling around on the floor. I've taken some permissions for some videos. So those people, if you give them mirtazapine, <clears throat> the legs will just take off. So you have to be very, very careful that we do not worsen a pre-existing condition. And the history, you know, I think in the whole of the sleep medicine, the history is very important. So be sure that when you ask, you know what we are asking. And if the patient tells us something, we should really be alert as to listen to the patient and make modifications. So I hope Shilpa, in short, that's what it is. But like I said, I think 2019, um, there were these American Academy guidelines, which have been updated also about the role of um, pharmacotherapy in chronic insomnia. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for answering. Anything, anybody else has a question? We'll answer a few questions and I'll do a short presentation. Ma'am, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sure, sure. Yeah, ma'am. Um, we are seeing a lot of patients uh, with the stroke and uh, obstructive sleep apnea, but most of the things, uh, uh, we don't evaluate any, most of the patients with stroke because they may be either disabled or that part is uh, mostly neglected. So in a stroke patient, uh, what will be the approach to uh, evaluate a patient who is having snoring, uh, whether it is a hospital-based um, uh, management or uh, like, can you explain? I haven't uh, got any good explanation regarding that. Yeah, so uh, there are numerous ways. So the pathophysiology, if you will read, uh, there are immense amount of literature on this. But just to put it simply, there are numerous ways. One is the central involvement. So there, are, there could be areas in the brainstem which are involving the muscles. And after all, it's the all airway and which can cause 
a significant impact on the breathing. That's one point. Second is, of course, there could be, um, but sleep apnea can be a risk factor for stroke. Okay, then there can be obtunded sensorium because of the anterior pathways also, and that can also cause things like obstructed breathing. So there are numerous ways in which patients with stroke are more predisposed or it's been sleep apnea has been sitting there for a while and they've got a stroke. Coming to the second point is about evaluation. So that also, if you look, there will be lots of articles which you'll come across. But in short, the studies have been done. So initially, like people who did them very early on, they found that the percentage of sleep apnea was very high. And logically so, because the muscles are involved and should they be all be treated or what should happen? I mean, that's like a difficult thing to determine. So then they shifted it. Then they said, okay, let's do something at about one week. Then there are some studies which have come that let's do at the time of discharge in a stable patient. So then you will be uh, left with that bunch of people who really are having sleep apnea, which is, which is probably persistent and a residual sleep apnea, not that acute setting. So that was one part of it. How did they determine who to evaluate? They did the si simple test like stop bang. In fact, there was another study which did only stop bag. They didn't do the end part. So the sensitivity specificity were pretty good. So that's at least they suggest that minimum that screening should be done. If found positive, now what's the next step? So the next step is that these people are sick, you know, sometimes let's assume like moderately sick. Uh, even if not moderately sick, they're not really very comfortable to the idea of doing like a full PSG. Uh, so though, and a lot of these studies have been done on a level three study. Okay. So if you do a level three study, so what is the caveat or what is the lacuna for a level three study is that you might miss the mild cases, but you will pick up the moderate and severe cases. And those are the ones who anyway need treatment to improve their outcome, the prognosis, recurrence. So for strokes, that's what we are concerned. And then, of course, there is this relationship with atrial fibrillation. So, you know, so things like that. So I think that part, uh, if you have your policies that, okay, I will evaluate them. The stop bank can be done when they get admitted, but have a fixed time period at the time that they would be evaluated before they get discharged. And the ones who are at high risk, uh, then it is our duty to, like we take care of all other risk factors, we should look for this risk factor also. Uh, anybody else has a question? Priyanka, you're on mute. Uh, Ma'am, there are some patients who are obese and they have OSA. And the question that they have is that uh, we ask them for both weight loss and CPAP. The question that they have is that once we have lost the weight, do we need to continue the CPAP forever or not? Because yeah, so CPAP part, has very poor compliance. Yeah, so CPAP has poor compliance for two reasons. One, uh, we, I think our way of educating is very, very important. So it's a very, uh, let's say novel method of treatment it's a much harder method of treatment than swallowing a pill. Uh, so what I have done in, like in my practice, our compliance I think is not excellent, but it's not bad also, is partly spending a lot of time in their education. So if you can't do it by yourself, uh, there is some one module which says starting up a sleep center, which I have put together, is that have people in your team who will do it. So it's not easy for you as a physician to take on this whole task that I uh, take a history, I evaluate, I advise the study, I interpret the study. I also discuss the report and I also talk about the pathophysiology and the outcome. So it's very tough. So I was doing it for many years, but it's very tiring and it's very tough. So then you make a team, educate people in your team but that's your job to educate and let them do little bits and pieces so that the, so you don't get that much of a task, but some things you remain, you keep to yourself. So coming back to this question of CPAP compliance, you educate the person about what is sleep apnea. 
what are the modes of treatment what are the advantages or the results of each mode of treatment and then and what is what happens if you don't treat and then let them absorb it for a few minutes and then say okay are you ready for a cpap and that's one part of it okay so then we need to motivate them a lot second part is the comfort level so if they are not comfortable they will throw it away so that again i encourage people to have a team so the technical support um, is very very important like my technicians have to be answerable to these people day and night so if they wear it at night they feel the air is too much they feel something is touching some my face is hurting so somebody has to answer each and every query so make them comfortable so if we achieve these two then i'm not saying it's 100% we will reach 40 50% which is worldwide so that's where we are coming to this question about weight loss and um, use of cpap okay so first when we talk about the pathophysiology with them we do know that weight is one factor which is contributing or which is the pathogenic mechanism for osa but there are numerous other factors so which are not related to the weight i have a whole lot of northeastern population thin all severe oss so i can't tell them to keep losing weight when their bmi is at 24 and 23 so you have to tell this patient that weight is a big factor your structure of your jaw your breathing internal control etc so a lot of mechanisms are there but like we work so we take each risk factor at a time so you need to work on your lifestyle if you're smoking and alcohol and the weight now what is the impact of weight so there is a lot of literature about the impact of weight loss and its effect on the ahi so roughly a 10% loss of your weight will move your ahi by about 8 or 10 something like that and the people who have even post done studies for bariatric surgery so even post bariatric surgery there is a residual osa which gets left behind is the residual mild or is it moderate or severe is what will determine that cpap has to be used or not so if it's mild yes you know i have in all my practice maybe seen on my fingertips i can count who've gone off the cpap so there was a neighbor here a young person mid 30s i think weight was about 90 or 100 kg so he's come after many years and he's about i think 65 kg or something and we did a sleep study so there is mild osa now so then i said theek hai fair enough he can stop you know so there are like few cases you will remember because but maybe all everything else was okay the anatomy was okay the closing critical closing pressures were okay airways were all right so that's what you need to tell them that yes sure go ahead lose the weight we will uh, reevaluate and maybe you will need it maybe not but we can't i don't like to give it to them as a dictum that you lost lose the weight and then now you'll be off um anybody else uh, uh ma'am sunil thakur this side okay So uh ma'am introduce yourself a bit we didn't know where where are you from and what is your background ma'am i am uh, working in resmed okay uh, i left the resmed in april I, i have started my own work i want to know how to do the sleep study and how to decide uh, see auto sleep is required or bipap is required for the patient okay so i have joined this meeting Okay, where are you currently? Which city? In Delhi, uh, Greater Noida. Acha, okay. <laughs> so that actually is. Uh, so I want. I'm answering a whole lot of these questions, but like I said, this course that that we put together, the first one is what is called as a basic course, and why I called it basic was um, to give people a little insight into just the basics of sleep. you know how to take a history what is a sleep study what are the levels of sleep study uh, and then we have a lot of more advanced modules because once you get that basic framework unfortunately in undergrad post grad post post grad we don't spend much time learning about this so this entity gets neglected 
And that's why this thought. Now, your question is actually pretty complicated. So I'm not sure I can address it very simply here. To determine whether you need a CPAP or a BiPAP, there are numerous things. But first and foremost, is a very, very good sleep study. And actually before that is the patient's history. You know, so there are some indicators or pointers which start pointing towards a BiPAP straight away. So things like morbid obesity, baseline saturations remaining very low, COPDs along with OSA, what is called as OSA, HS, all those entities should initially make you more alert that I may not be able to control it with a CPAP and you need to keep your BiPAP ready. So now BiPAPs also, if you work with ResMed, you know that there is a BiPAP, then they have something called as an air curve, which are, you know, and then they have something called as a Lumis, you know, so which are different modes of BiPAP to put it simply. Mm -hmm. So, you know, which one will you go to? Will it require one night? Will it require two nights? So all this um, for the others is like, we must discuss this in the beginning with the patient. You know, that I may be possible, may not be able to uh, do everything in one night because they don't like. So best is to open up the communication, whatever you know, you share with them. Okay. So that's one. And during the night, how do you determine is that when the pressures go very high, 15, 16, 17, 18, you're not able to control the apneic events. Desaturations are persisting sleep is getting very fragmented, then you do have to move on to a bypass. But like I said, so I tell the people this, that there is one night. So in the first part, you do diagnostic, then you do PAP, then you switch to bypass. So I mean, so you're running out of time. So internationally, they don't do everything in one night. Uh, in fact, if it's a bypass, all internationally, they will do two nights of study. So split night, as we call it, as you have read, is usually we go from diagnostic to a CPAP. But in our country, uh, you know, there is a financial issue, time issue. So sometimes we do, but the technician has to be really very good. Uh, why? Is because based on the study, you will advise the device. And if you think about it, uh, if it's all what we call it as out-of-pocket expense. So CPAPs are ranging from 45 to 55,000, you know, something like that. The BiPAPs will start at 65, 75, 85. Lumis is about, uh, AVAPs is about 1 lakh, 90,000. So, I mean, you should really be sure uh, what does the patient need, you know. There's no end, just uh, no reason just to go right up to the top and, you know, just for the sake of it in your device. I mean, the patient is paying from their pocket. So I think we have a few people. I'm just going to share my screen a bit and just go through some things and then we'll come back to your question answers again. Uh, so this is of course just that. So like I was saying, uh, why did we think about it? And you know, the Sleep Medicine Institute, as I called it, um, it was very simply decided and I just thought that because there's a lot of demand, it's a definitely an emerging medical speciality, but there is, seems to be a lacuna in our education so far. And that was the aim as to why it was started, to provide or to provide some basic practical knowledge and to bridge this gap. For who was this was the next question, who am I or who is the audience and who do we want, which kind of people? So I think it's doctors and in doctors, like I'm glad we have a host of people. So you will, uh, I am, you know, this meeting, if it closes, we will just, I think you people have another link. So we just click back onto the other link. Snigda, they have the other link? Yes, ma'am, they have that second link. Okay, so just if, if we lose you, then just come back on that second link. Yes. So this was meant for doctors of all special specialities. Uh, technical people, see, without good technical people, we cannot you know, do the speciality well. So we need really their good support. And I'm still thinking and planning of having something uh, separate for them. In the, but it's this issue of language. So I don't mind interacting with a few of you who feel that technicians need to be uh, educated a lot more. And how do we educate them a lot? Anybody and anybody who wants to grow their field or their career in the field of state medicine. 
And what do we really want to give is, I just, like I said, I want to make it very simple for skills and to be a practical thing. What have we done so far? It's, uh, it was in my mind for quite a while, but we did this uh, during the lockdown last year and uh, started with this basic course. But then I realized like as people get that knowledge, they want to get into something more. So there are a lot of advanced uh, modules as well, which are independent about 45 minutes to one hour modules. If you all are interested, look at those. And like I said, we have a bunch of people now who have all joined this fraternity or this online classroom system. And I have invited faculty who are experts in their field. Uh, recently, we put out one for movement disorders in sleep. We have one from RLS, Dr. Diego, etc., And Dr. Deepa, Dr. Preeti, all who are very well informed teachers. Um, the basic course we divided into theory and practical because I felt that, uh, and the practical actually was mostly done by my staff and who we made simple steps as to what do we do in our day-to-day -day practice, as you may have seen. These are all the advanced modules, but you can look at the site again. And uh, I thought that, you know, we will do some bundling offers as they are called, that if people pick up multiple things together, you write to Snigda, she will tell you what are the best options possible. But they go from uh, general concepts to testing like MSLP, MWT, et cetera, and narcolepsy, dental, ENT approach. You know, what should you look for in the uh, local examination? The other upcoming courses, of course, would include, um, I have requests for gynae, pediatrics, uh, you know, and things like that. And how can you help us? Uh, what we will give you at the end is like a small form. But any suggestions, what kind of topic, anything that you would like improved in the way of teaching, uh, you know, definitely write and we will incorporate. I've been, I think you've got a few mails about this Google Classroom. Uh, why the Google Classroom? It's, see, if you were, imagine if all of you 10, 11 or 15, 20 were sitting in a class, you know, you would interact with each other. You would, you would know about each other that what is each one doing? What is my level of interest? Discuss your cases. So this is, is just simply like that. It's not a compulsory thing, but it's something good that people join. Um, you can post your cases there. You can post some interesting uh, questions there. If somebody has an interesting journal article, we can post it there. Some uh, upgrade comes, we'll post it there. So I would encourage people to join this uh, Google Classroom. <clears throat> So after this, you will get a very, very simple quiz. It's just a formality. Like I said before, it's not really to test you as such. And the moment you do that, submit your uh, responses for suggestions and you would get an e-certificate. And that's, I think that's all. Um, some other general questions that people have asked often, I'm going to just uh, uh, answer them all together. Can I start clinical practice with the use of this certificate? See, in our country, um, we don't have set so far really guidelines as to who is to be called a sleep specialist. And I discussed this with the president of the Indian Society for Sleep Research as well, that how do I call myself a sleep medicine practitioner? I agree. See, if you call yourself a neurologist, you've done a DM neurology. If you call yourself a pulmonologist, you've done something. But this, but I, all that I want to say, these are clinical courses that I have put up. So it gives you your acumen, your clinical judgment gets enhanced and you will be able to do a better job with your patients because sleep is not coming isolated. It's coming or sleep problems. It's coming as a mixture of all specialities. Okay. Uh, practicals, how can they be done online? This you may have seen that we have tried to take simple models and talk about it as if, you know, if I'm addressing a classroom, uh, is it for eligible for practicing? So again, like I said, this is a clinical um, certificate for yourself and maybe will it help with my uh, exams or will it help me with my job so this is obviously if you have something you've done something to enhance your knowledge I think that's always going to be in good standing and nowadays certificates and all are important but I think people do like to when they interview you what else is it that you know and what is your knowledge like so I think that's all that I have for this kind of a presentation because the idea was not for a presentation, but just to you know put some thoughts together. So um, in case we do get 
Okay. Anybody else has anything? Otherwise, we can. Uh, any other questions or any other thoughts? If everybody is clear, then that's also fine. Then we will. I'd like to thank uh, you all for joining this and for attending this um, and giving me this opportunity. But I would encourage people to become part of that Google Classroom. Put up your questions that you have. There were some questions about restless leg syndrome and treatment. That's a very, very big question. And I think if some people want, they can read, uh, join Dr. Diego's lecture. He's done a very good job on that. Um, video module, how long will they be available? So normally, Shrikda, how long are we giving them for the access? For modules? All the videos, the basic course is available to them. Basic for course is for three months. Three months. Yes. So... Uh, that's all I think that we have for today then. Somebody had asked a practical approach and evaluation of patient with snoring. I think there's also a separate module on this about the whole snoring thing. And there's yes. also an ENT aspect. So if people want to go a little deeper into it, they can go into that. Anybody else has anything? Uh, Mama, I had one question. Yeah, sure. Okay. Mama, I just wanted to ask, like, uh, how is sleep related to different specialties? Like you were talking about sleep related to gynecology and practice of pediatrics and pulmonology. We all know neurology. We all know. We all know about psychiatry. But how, like, if we have to train the sleep gynecologist and inform that how is it related to your specialty? Then what do we educate them? What do we inform them that how do they get themselves involved with sleep? That is one thing I want to. If you look at the as, so there are sleep actually is involved in all the there's a sleep across the women. Yes, ma'am, exactly. A podcast recently by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which is like a gist which you can listen to in your time. But basically, in pregnancy, it's very important. It has an impact on the fetus weight, growth, development. Then it comes to the menopause. I mean, like uh, Shilpa had talked about vast number, large number of women with perimenopausal, menopausal, postmenopausal have sleep issues. And the gynecologist, all that they know is to prescribe a sedative hypnotic. So whether there is an underlying depression, whether it is poor sleep hygiene, today I saw a lady, she's napping through the day, 71 years old, and is insisting that she is not sleeping the whole night. You know, so there are just sleep hygiene or sleep practices or cognitive behavioral therapy, which needs to be done. And mom, okay. RLS in women, which is very, very true. Good. Yes, ma'am. PCOS and sleep, which I have a talk in the coming month. There is some. So there is a lot of these little, little things where they can be related. Ma'am, so uh, like in the long run, will sleep be included? Uh, will it be a spe uh, uh, an entity in medical science as a different branch? Or gradually will it be bribed into every specialty because MBBS curriculum, like you were talking, that need to be enhanced? doctors at md level and then after that even in dm yeah. so that should ideally be happening okay so like us has fellowships in sleep medicine so if you are at any level you can apply for that fellowship in sleep medicine and you will then go through the whole curriculum of sleep medicine. okay thank you ma'am yet but we should be reaching so we need every special but specialist or every speciality should understand that sleep is an issue and we should ask a question to every patient that we come across, at least one or two questions. How is your night and how is your day? Ma'am, will it be an overstatement to say that these questionnaires like Stop Bank and uh, Berlin's and uh, the RLS questionnaire and uh, insomnia? Shita, where are you exactly these days and what are you doing? Ma'am, I'm in Lucknow. I'm an associate professor in physiology. Okay. I also cleared the World Sleep Federation exam for uh, like certified sleep specialist. I'm interested into sleep, basically the research part, ma'am. But what I've really found is uh, in different specialties, uh, people find it really difficult interpreting the polysomnograph. The PSGs are difficult interpreting and also the awareness is lacking. Even the uh, neurologists, until they are specially interested, they find it really difficult. Something it's like something has to be done to make it a uh, routine practice in all specialties. That is what I yeah, feel. Yeah, I, I think, yes, that's a totally valid point and see because I think we've started considering it like a separate field you know in that way you are right it's it's like so I talk about like the three pillars of health you know so we talk we all know a lot about nutrition these days 
we know a lot about exercise but somehow we don't know talk so much about sleep uh, so and for many disorders whether it is metabolic whether it is cognitive neurology um, whether it is cardiovascular diseases and in cardiovascular it is uh, coronary artery disease arrhythmias heart failures so even in each Disorders. 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 Um, like I, uh, I saw a patient who's actually been my patient for about three, four years. Um, he's actually pretty young in the sense that he's six, fifty-nine, sixty. So I think I must have been seeing him for four or five years. Um, he had complaints of uh, impaired, up I mean, the snoring. That's one part of it. Very severe daytime sleepiness. He's walking in the bank, but then he started saying that I'm forgetting, which is like his somebody's uh, mic is. On. Uh, so it's like so some memory impairment. Uh, then he started talking about a lot of vivid dreaming. Uh, he had dream enactment. He's hit a couple of times and he's fallen off the bed. So that was about three, four years ago. And I, when we did the sleep study, um, he had definite OSA. His uh, mini mental state exam was mildly deranged. Um, and he had this entity called RBD on sleep study. So if he was to, and he looked very dull. So people were thought he's in depression. So they gave him antidepressants. So which added to his problem. He started thrashing at night a lot more. And then I put him on the CPAP and we did the psychological assessment, taught him some exercises for the brain, etc. sent him back. He, he did one uh, online call. He's somewhere from far away from Delhi. One online call, he was doing well. Next online call, uh, about a few months ago, he stopped using the device. Uh, he looked really dull. He considerably slowed down. Speech was not regular, uh, good. Writing had got impaired and he was not able to walk. And then I told the daughter who's in Delhi that please, you know, bring him here. He will worsen. So today I just saw him in the afternoon and he has dysarthria. He has a tremor. His gait has become slow. He can barely, if I show you his writing, it's very bad. He said month is October. So everything is going wrong. And his hitting and thrashing has gone off. So, you know, he's like a typical patient who has multiple problems. So we cannot hope to achieve uh, that a person sees him and treats only OSA and says, that's why I feel more and more that people, who, uh, we can't have boundaries like this, that there's only sleep apnea. I don't look at, you know, I don't know what is RBD. I mean, things like that. So uh, sleep is a very multidimensional speciality and uh, we need to work. And so we, and a neurologist can't say that, oh, you know, I don't know how to use a CPAP and I'm not sure I can do it. So I'll refer to my pulmonologist. So the patient then will, so we need help. Like I do have psychologists with us. We have psychiatrists with us, but the rest, most of it, you should do yourself. And you should also be learning a little bit about the CBTI, the components of CBTI, because each time the patient comes, you have to interact with the patient and tell them what to do and what not to do. Um, and similarly, you know, you may have cardiologists, you may have ENT people. So have form a group uh, who you are comfortable and compatible with that you do need uh, ENT help. And you know, those, there are separate modules which have discussed that which kind of patients to go for surgery, what kind of surgery. So definitely there's a role for everything. Uh, but we need to work together and we need to recognize uh, that there are different, uh, somebody nicely said uh, the other day, uh, the lady who, Dr. Susanna, did a session for MFT, and I liked her analogy. She said, like, if you put all the ingredients together, you'll make a very nice cake. And if you miss out, then you won't. You know? So we need to work on every aspect. So we make the person healthy and whole. Uh, so like this patient, I had to send him off today because he came with his wife. She couldn't understand anything. So I said, you please bring your daughter. We need to talk to you seriously. Otherwise, your health, I mean, it's, it's scary what will happen to him in another five years. So I think that these are the kind of cases uh, I can put up some in that Google Classroom off and on, and you people can put them up. Once you start recognizing, you'll pick up a lot more. 
and uh, you know narcolepsy is another uh, very very big scare uh, i have a lot of them on my follow up children who and adults who have suffered a lot i have doctors who have suffered a lot and uh, so i think we need to just be a threshold for awareness goes down and yes shweta we educate people wherever we are i think that's the message uh, whatever we can do wherever we are just keep spreading the word and people who are in multi speciality hospitals big hospitals uh, continuously kind of do small meetings but go into the other specialities so like if i have to i go into the cardiology meetings and you should talk there and tell them about the relationship of atrial fibrillation with osa or like you're saying stroke with osa cognitive impairment with osa then people get little interested but not general they won't get interested and of course the harmful effects of uh, sleeping pills sedative hypnotics which are being given like you know chocolates and toffees so they are causing so much cognitive impairment so again i want to thank you all uh, i think we are done with the question answers you all have a nice weekend enjoy yourselves get some time off now the big thing has become this time off and time to yourself uh, you need to rest okay everybody's done yes ma'am Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Bye, bye. Take care. Bye.